welcome Heather Booth. And I want to thank Ken. What a dynamic leader. He is so thorough, thoughtful, caring, persuasive. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. <laughs> thank you so much. And I also want to thank Meredith Dodson, who uh, I've worked with as a partner and co-conspirator on many of these issues. We want to thank her, the staff, as well as the leadership makes it work. Thank you, Meredith. But who I mainly want to thank is all of you. You are the passionate, compassionate, committed, dedicated, caring, focused, effective people who get results. And it's just the kind of organization we need in these times. So thank all of you. We need it particularly now because these are perilous times, as well as inspiring times. It's perilous because you just look at the day's news. Poverty is increasing in many places. The, the disparity is increasing between the wealthiest and those who still need the sustenance of life. We see uh, in, in the United States, it's almost like whiplash. You wake up one morning and you say, what are the issues? It, the Supreme Court, it's food stamps, it's taxes, it's you just overwhelming almost. It's also an inspiring time because we pe see people like you standing up, taking action, joining with neighbors, joining with others on the immigration, uh, on the immigration issue, we see people standing up. On the Women's March, we see people standing up. On the kids from Parkland, we see people lying down. <laughs> Whatever the tactic, there is inspiration and you provide part of that inspiration. And the main lesson is that if we organize, we can change the world, but only if we organize. Even when times are most desperate, we need to remember how far we've come as well as how far we need to go. And so to give an example out of my early life in organizing, when things were really desperate, and to draw lessons from it and parallels to the very work that Results does. This session will be a very short overview, just a taste of an aspect of organizing, which is both movement building and recruiting others to increase our numbers. In 1964, I went to Mississippi in an effort that many of you have heard about called the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. You may have heard of the project where uh, in Mississippi, poor black people really lived with lives that were being terrorized, not allowed to vote, often sharecroppers, not really with even independent means to support their families. And so there was a call in addition to the organizing that they were doing remarkably in the state, they called for Northern students to come down and support the effort. This is me at 18 with Fannie Lou Hamer. Some of you may have, we should <laughs> applaud Fannie Lou Hamer. She was one of the great heroes, heroines of the movement. She, by the way, said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Uh, and, uh, uh, here she is in front of her house in Rollville, Mississippi, with two of her friends. This, by the way, is me, again, uh, in Shaw, Mississippi, um, providing support for a voter registration effort. And it was not intended as a civil disobedience. It was, in fact, a civil obedience. But the uncivil uh, sheriffs in that area arrested us. It was my first arrest. And. Uh, one of the many tactics we can use, not the only one, but one of the many tactics, um, and this was a voter registration effort. Many of you heard about the summer project because there were three young volunteers, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, who were picked up by the sheriff and released into the hands of the Klan. Their bodies were found several weeks later. What you may not have heard 
is that while they were looking for the bodies of those three young men, they found the bodies of other black men whose hands had been bound or feet were chopped off, this one in the Tallahatchie or Pearl River. Those disappearances hadn't even been reported. And when the bodies were found, they weren't investigated until many years later as cold cases because black lives did not matter in Mississippi in 1964. However, because people organized, because people wrote letters, they went to see their members of Congress. However frightening that was, they realized those people should be working for us. Is that right, results? Yeah. You, they got into the uh, newspapers. They figured out tactics to get visibility. Parents talked about their kids and the lives that was happening to them, what was happening to real people in Mississippi. And within a year, there was a Voting Rights Act, and Mississippi now has more African-American elected officials than any other state in the country. And the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, Shockwe Lumumba, says that he is the most radical progressive mayor in all of the United States. And that's because we make change when people organize. Now we have a long way to go. Trayvon Martin and Freddie Gray and others, names we don't even know, tell us we have a long way to go, but we make progress when we organize. These are some of the principles of direct action organizing. And by organizing, I mean bringing people together for their interests to make change together. Because alone we may feel, I'm not good enough, I don't know enough, I don't know if I can really do this. Many of us feel that insecurity. I'd say, I'd ask for a raising of hands of who feels that insecurity, but some might feel too insecure to raise their hands. <laughs> But we know that people feel that way. We need to give them support. But together, we can be strong. So here are three principles to keep in mind. One is based on our values, and it all starts with values. I actually believe it all starts with love. We need to keep love at the center of all we do. Based on our, yes, uh, let's just hear it for love. <laughs> love is in woeful poor supply in some circles these days, <laughs> but not at results. Based on our values, we want to win, not just protest, but to win real improvements in people's lives, that they have food to eat, clean water to drink, health care when they're sick, caring for their children. We want concrete improvements in people's lives in addition to the vision, democracy, ending poverty, broad visions. What does it mean for real people? Number two, we give people a sense of their own power. And here is something where uh, Ken has asked me to encourage results to expand what it's been doing. We often do advocacy for others. So we take their letters, we take their stories, we take their voices, and we say, our Congress people, this is a story from someone in Mississippi, in Texas, in Savannah. I'm suggesting that we find ways to reach out and build support from others, and we come with them. And as those numbers increase, our power will increase. This is not just about us advocating for them, it's them advocating for themselves, and when they do, they will gain a sense of confidence, dignity, and respect, and their own power. And the third, is to begin to change the relations of power, which means building our organization, increasing the numbers, and also holding those in power more accountable. Here are three elements of organizing. There are many, many elements, but here are three I wanted to emphasize for this session, which is about recruitment. Number one is about relationship. Sometimes you think that recruitment is I want you to do what I want. Come over and do what I want. <laughs> oh, that makes me feel really warm and fuzzy. <laughs> you miss a meeting, and they say, well, where the heck were you? You miss a meeting, and you say, say to someone, we missed you at the meeting. What's going on? And they may say, my mother's ill. I." I didn't feel I'd be comfortable at the meeting. We need to know that. The meeting's boring. We need to know that. <laughs> it was my birthday. Birthday? I'm going to send them a birthday card. I'm going to put it on a list and send them a birthday card every year. 
We want a relationship with real people. Number two, we want to know their interests as well as their values. Again, this is not about us. I had this example in the movie last night, but someone once was recruiting me to work on the environment. I was working on voting rights issues. I was working night and day. I was trying to get a graduate degree. I was working full time at a regular job. I had two little kids at home pulling at my skirt. And on the phone, the person said, would you come down and phone bank on the environment? And I said, I just can't now. And they said, you're too apathetic. <laughs> and I realized apathy is when someone else doesn't do what you want them to do. They want to do what they want to do. So we need to find out what they want to do. We need to listen. Someone said five times with your ears, once with your mouth. What are their interests? When they said, we can affect uh, the pollution that's causing your son's asthma, I was there the next day and was fully active in the organization. That's what I cared about. And the third is that we give people a sense of their own power. The reason for coming together is in order to win, and together we can win what we can't just win on our, on our own. And then I wanted to go into just a few elements of recruitment, because if we want to build these organizations, what is this recruitment, this organizing to get many others? And our power, we don't have the big power of the big money, though we do need the money, and thanks for your support. <laughs> but we won't match them, but we can outnumber them, because this is a democracy. And where it's not yet a democracy in some of the countries you're working, we can build that grassroots democracy. So the first element that I just encourage, and you're, in a minute we're going to do one-on-one -on -one role plays to act this out, uh, is to find out who you're talking to. And to make sure you're talking to people who are open to becoming mobilized. There are two kinds of people in general that we're looking for. One are those who are already with us but don't know that it can really make a difference. They share our values, they have concern about the issues, they may go to our same uh, congregation. Um, we may have seen them um, or heard that they support some particular issue, but just don't, either don't think it'll make a difference, don't know what to do, don't know how to do it. And those are people who are, we need to motivate and mobilize and move into action. Then there's some people who aren't sure. Well, this issue of immigration is a complicated issue. Well, let's discuss it. This issue of poverty, what is it that people really have done for themselves? But you know the answers. We can discuss that if, in fact, we have shared values. So we need to know who they are and have a list of those people in mind that we are recruiting. And I'm suggesting this because there's going to be a homework assignment after this uh, plenary. And I'm going to ask that you actually build a list of people that you will recruit from. Individuals, those who are already interested but don't know how to get involved, that may be the first place to start. Those who might be for you but need some support. And then to go out and actually recruit people. The second point, you ask questions. What's their story? Why do they have those values? What are their values? Are they interested? What's their connection? Have they ever faced situations like this? Have they, do they know people who have faced situations like this? And listen, and then connect. And the third, is once you've heard, then we have things we can offer people to do. You know, we have a letter writing meeting. You know, why don't you join us? We're gonna go to meet with our congressperson. Oh, I couldn't do that. You know, that's just what I thought when I was first starting. But we support you, you'll learn how to do it. And it is amazing. You'll see the Congress people or their staffs sometimes be frightened of us because we have the votes across party lines, part of our power. And then 
You need to know when you hear that, can you increase what you're asking? Oh, do you have other friends that you can bring also? Could we possibly meet at your house? And also to decrease. And you say, well, I couldn't go to the congressman's office, congressperson's office. But, okay, um, would you join us on a phone bank? Or we're gonna have a celebration after we come out of the office. Would you greet us when we come out of the office? And the last is to make sure there's a follow-up. So we're gonna meet on Tuesday and um, I'll call you on Monday night to make sure you do have that ride to the, to the event. Uh, if not, I'll be glad to give you a ride. So kind of close the deal. And now we are gonna turn this over to you. What we're gonna ask is that you pair up with a person next to you, either side by side or front and back. And this section will take 20 minutes. You are the, who was the plenary speaker today? You are the plenary speakers. This will be about 20 minutes. And we'll ask, each of you are your real people, but one is your real self who is active in results. The other is not yet active in results, doesn't even know much about results, but knew this was a group that you were involved in. But it's a person, let's say, it, just imagine you either are in the same congregation or you, your kids both are on the same soccer team or on, uh, <laughs> they're in uh, uh, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts together or something like that. And you're gonna introduce yourself, say why you're talking to them, very briefly, 30 seconds, and then ask them to tell their story about why they might be concerned about poverty and the condition of real people in whatever country you're in, in whatever city you're in. We'll do that for five minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute warning. So one just asks in 30 seconds, hi, I'm Heather, and um, you know, I've been part of results, and you seem to be very concerned about it. You, I see you tithe in our congregation, so I wanted to ask you, are you interested in actually doing something to alleviate poverty, to end poverty? And you see what they say. Could you tell me your story about why you do that? And you listen. And then I'll give a one minute warning, and at that point we can see your response to the other person. The whole thing is five minutes for the first round. Then you do a five minute debrief, and you each talk about, well, what happened? How did it feel? There's really some magic about having people tell their story and a magic about asking people about their story. And then you switch roles. And then the other one is a member of Results. And you're a person who may not have been active in anything, but you do care. These children crying, it nags at you, it tears your heart. And you do that, I'll give you a one minute warning, and then you do another debrief. That'll take about 20 minutes. And then, if my timing is right, we should still have about 10 minutes for a final uh, reactions, Q&A, discussion, and homework assignment. Because we want you to feel comfortable, and there's other training and support I'm sure Ken and Meredith and others can provide, so that you set a goal for yourself. Is it five people to recruit? Is it 10? Who would they be? When would you contact them? So with that, do people feel about ready to do this? Yes. Okay, but let's do that again. Do you feel about ready to do this? Yes. Okay. Oh, I, I'm, I, can't, I can't hear. Um, so, let's start now. If you have a question, you can come on up. Uh, come on up and ask me. So, start now for the first five-minute round. Mm -hmm. 